How can a country grant single mom's allowance while also prohibiting abortion? One is a woman's right, the other one seems to deny the right of women over their own bodies. One word, pronatalism. Pronatalism is an ideology that considers women first and foremost as baby makers. It rewards social, financial for having babies. And it is the system we are living in. This video is the second part of what is becoming a mini-series of video in which I'm trying to understand what pronatalism means from an interview with film director Ferris Scherster about her new film. It got bigger and bigger. Like, no, this isn't just your, the, what the family is saying to you. This is what we see in commercials and on TV shows and movies. I highly recommend you to watch the first part, but to sum things up, let's say that I showed from a study uh, written by Leslie King, I showed that France was highly pronatalized in the 80s until now. And I also showed that although pronatalist measures and policies sound like feminism, they are not because they impair women to be homemakers. So Leslie King is a professor of sociology. She wrote this study called France Needs Children in which she's showing that after uh, in France, birth pill and abortion became legal, um, we had a series of pronatalist policies that were um, supporting women is ha in having as many babies as possible. And in the study, she wrote, policymakers are often more concerned in ensuring the reproduction of the nation than with women's interests. In the first video, I talked about this advertising campaign that was displayed in the 80s in the street in France that was aiming to support people in having more babies. And actually, when you look at it, you realize it's maybe racist. The fertility rate at that time was dropping in France and it was a big debate. And actually, Alain Lipietz, who is a journalist for Le Monde, wrote in 1985, he wrote in an article, if France needed to grow, why not admit immigrants? So the study shows that behind those pronatalist policies uh, in France lies the willingness to preserve the white European identity. Um, Georgina Dufois is the minister who passed all our pronatalist policies in the 80s and she said, the French birth rate is altogether insufficient. We absolutely must have more children. France's place in Western civilization and in the world is at stake. Leslie King also wrote in her study, while in official documents, demographers and government officials stress economic issues, such as paying retirement and health care benefits of the elderly and ensuring a useful and vital labor force, much of the less formal discussion centers on national power and retaining the French culture, language and political heritage. And so what I found out is that historically, pronatalist policies are often linked to authoritarian regimes. The Francoism saw the society centered around the family institution, and in this family institution, the woman is the wife and the stay-at-home mother. As the government saw women pursuing careers as something negative, because it prevented women from making babies, women were educated to become moms. In Europe at the time, Spanish women were those who worked the least. The Large Family Protection Act reads, only people with fertile families can spread their race across the world, create and sustain empires. Demographic vitality increases international personality and military power. To influence people in making a lot of babies, the Spanish government used mass information like the cinema. The Nodo was a state-controlled series of cinema newsreels produced in Spain from 1943 to 1981 and closely associated with Franco's regime. They had a show in which they awarded the largest family in Spain. Two famous movies were released at the time, La Grande Familia, 1963, and La Familia y Uno Mas in 1965. Very conservative, respectful of the established order, they were promoting family birth, giving as an example a family of 16 children. What's funny is that when I told my dad I was working on that, he remembered that in the 80s, I wasn't born at the time, but he, he told me that in the 80s, 
um, a movie in France was released. It was called Les Trois Hommes un Couffin, which means three men and a bassinet. And actually, I find it is an interesting coincidence because the story is uh, three roommates, male roommates, who are really career focused, um, mainly using uh, women for sex and not at all into baby and families. And suddenly they have to look after a baby for months. Um, I don't know. I just find it interesting that it came out at the time where uh, the fertility rate and all the thing about like having more babies was a big thing in France. And I watched the film and I had a, a huge baby fever, but I also understood the philosophy of the film as like a progressive pronotalism, like it's not because you want to be free that you can't have a baby. You can still be a free, a free person um, and have a baby. And it also promotes new forms of families because in the end you have like four people looking after one baby. So the influence of mainstream media on our social construct is major. Coming back to Therese Schechter, who is the film director who released uh, a film about pronatalism, uh, we talked about it and she told me that TV has played a major role in how she, in, on, on her perception of the childless woman. I remember watching TV shows and just absolutely not understanding the female characters and the way they were written. You know, like, you know, if we're talking about, you know, women without children, um, she does a whole chapter on this American TV show 30 something. I don't know if you even know it. I think it was on in the 80s, 90s. Okay. Anyway, during my formative years. Um, and there are two women on the show who don't have children. And one of them really wants children and is completely neurotic. And another one who doesn't want children, you know, because she's a career woman and she's a real bitch, you know, and it's like, and they're both unhappy all the time. It's like, but that's the life I want. <laughs> I want. I want that. <laughs> Why are they gonna have those? Good? Like, I am aspiring to this person's life, and you're showing me that she's miserable all the time. I was so confused by this. And, and in Backlash, she breaks down the whole show and these characters and how it was written by people who were quite conservative, actually. And they wanted to push this idea that happiness comes from having a, a, well, a heterosexual partner and children and a nice house and a good job, like this is where happiness lies. But of course, the, the, the woman who did have all of that was also miserable all the time. <laughs> so, because she missed her, her career, frankly. She, she wasn't working anymore. And she missed her career and she was unhappy, but they kept putting obstacles in the way for her to have the career. It's a terrible show. I watched it religiously. I mean, you know, I watched it all the time. Because I was looking for myself, you know, and not so really finding it. Do you, do you remember when you finally found some role models, either in mainstream cultures or, or maybe a series or, or movies nowadays that you thought, oh, okay, now we are like, we're finally showing something real to what can, to what, how a woman can be happy or... I think we're always in search of that. It's still not that easy to find, um, you know, like there, there are different, you know, characters on different TV shows, um, you know, in terms of people who don't have children and are role models. It's really interesting because sometimes they are role models, but you can look at it, their characters as being like not good characters, you know, also. Mm -hmm. um, people uh, are always talking about Grey's Anatomy, the TV show Grey's Anatomy, yeah. and um, uh, Dr. Christina Yang, who's played by uh, um, Sandra O. Oh. But you made me feel, yeah, you made me feel shiny and new, like a virgin. Hey, touch for the very first time, like a virgin. She doesn't want children. She talks about it all the time. She gets pregnant. She has an abortion. She's very much in control of her own narrative. You know, she knows what she wants and she's very um, secure in that. And it breaks up her. I, I don't watch Grey's Anatomy. Like I watch the episodes that 
like <laughs> important to <laughs> this this topic but i know a lot of people who love the show and so on one hand she's quite a role model because she knows what she wants and she lives her life accordingly and um, makes her own decisions and when she got pregnant she had an abortion which frankly if i got pregnant i would have an abortion because i actually don't want children <laughs> it's not negotiable and this is a part of reproductive health care so i don't have any um but she's also a difficult person you know she's like she's difficult she gets some sleep you look like crap i look better than you it's not possible so it kind of depends on how you how you interpret it um there's more but even when i when i started making i was a teenage feminist this was part of it it was this thing like i'm 40 i'm not married i don't have children i do not look like a supermodel have i completely failed at everything i was supposed to like achieve by this age um and i was asking myself those questions and then I thought, you know, back when I was 13, <laughs> I felt really good about it. Like, I felt very strong and empowered um, by this show, Free to Be You and Me, which again, I don't know if you're familiar with, but it was a, it's great. It's a very feminist, um, it was a TV special. It was a, like a standalone show and then there's an album. And it was just full of all of these very empowering stories for kids that just reinforced like you can be who you want to be, you know, that kind of thing. And when you talk to like gay men, they point to a very specific thing in that show that they saw that affected them. And, um, you know, like there's a lot like people of that generation kind of really, for me, it was the story of this princess who didn't want to get married and her husband, her father was forcing her to get married. Once upon a time, not long ago, there lived a princess named Atalanta, who could run as fast as the wind. She was so bright and so clever, and could build things and fix things so wonderfully that many young men wished to marry her. And there was a road race, and whoever won the race, the running race, because it's in medieval times, got to marry her. And she's like, okay, fine, as long as I can run in the race, and if I win the race, I don't have to marry anyone. Like just right there, you're like exploding <laughs> every convention of fairy tales. <laughs> and and what happens is she ties with this guy. She ties the race. And the king says, Okay, guy, you can marry my daughter since you tied. And he says, I would never marry your daughter if she doesn't want to get married, but I'd like to be her friend. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. I'm getting goosebumps. It's like perfect feminist, you know, fairy tale. Uh, and they become friends. Oh, that's amazing. That's it. <laughs> like, and, you know, they both go off exploring here and there separately. And I, the last line is, um, we don't know if they ever saw each other again, but we know they both lived happily ever after. Oh, oh that's awesome. I need to watch that. I need right? to so yeah know. it's called free to be you and me i don't think it's that hard to find um and uh yeah that that really rewired my brain at the age of 13. Oh, that's amazing so so i looked back at that time and i was like that was feminism feminists made me think about things really differently when i was young yeah. um but i lost my connection to it you know because we grow up and there's a world and there's people around you doing certain things. And so I was a teenage feminist was a was an attempt to find those things that I could reconnect to that were giving me the kind of messages like that that I wanted, for example. And you know, reading backlash was, <laughs> was actually part of it. Um, so when do you consider you you kind of found refound your thing? <laughs> I, I think during the making of that film, you yeah. know, during the, I mean, that was sort of my mission in, the, in this first ever documentary I made was to figure out what feminism meant in the 21st century. Like, what, it, what does it mean? And is it still around? And it was by all means still around, but it had been so suppressed in the 80s and 90s. Um, 
and this was coming off of the 90s like riot girl stuff riot girl music there was a third wave feminism kind of thing so that was also part of the film yeah i think it was just making the film and the people i met making the film also of course because i was putting myself into these uh environments that i hadn't been in before you know so like i'm the last person to have discovered like riot girl music you know <laughs> like <laughs> i'm a, you know it's like oh wow this is really good yeah. <laughs> this is really <laughs> so yeah i <sighs> There's stuff around. I think there was more in the 70s, to be perfectly honest. I think we have regressed. Um, I had more role models in the 70s than I think I would find really? yeah. now. Mm. I think so. People may not agree with me, but yeah. I think I first heard about feminism in 1974, the year I turned 13. It was all around me in the 70s. And it gave me power. The power to be smart, to be independent, and to be myself. It all seemed so much simpler then. I'm turning 40 this year, and I realize that I haven't thought about feminism in years. But lately, as I've looked at the world around me, I've had this feeling like I don't measure up. I'm not a wife, I'm not a mother, and I'm not a supermodel. What I am is a woman who feels incredible pressure to conform to an ideal that I don't even buy into. Is it possible to be who I want to be without judgment or apology or compromise? What happened to my feminism and the power it gave me? Did I lose it or did it lose me? And what can I do to find it again? So while in the North, we are told to make as many babies as possible, I wondered what happened in the South. Il y a vraiment une dimension raciste vraiment claire, parce qu'en France aussi, on encourage à avoir des enfants. Françoise Vergès is a French author, and she wrote Le Ventre des Femmes, which means woman's womb. And she recalls that when France was still denying the right to abortion to women in France, they were performing thousands of forced sterilizations on the island of La Réunion, which is a French Caribbean island. C'est pas simplement que l'avortement est criminalisé en France, c'est qu'aussi il y a les allocations familiales, on construit des crèches, enfin il y a tout un discours et un dispositif. Donc c'est qui doit naître, qui a le droit de naître et qui n'a pas le droit de naître. What France has done at La Réunion is something that has been done in a lot of other countries in the world. For example, in Britain, in 1968, it was revealed that uh, forced sterilizations had been done and led to the deportation of American missionaries. In Bolivia, a movie called El Sangre del Condor, I don't speak Spanish, so don't judge, um, came out at some point and it was co-signed by doctors and it was protesting about forced sterilization that had been done uh, during the colonization. <laughs> Mana onko zikripungu, chai supa yonkolka, tukui ai lukuna pin. Imatachus coca will awasum, chai ta wasuncha. Coca mama, chai suertita will arrive, chai patukui, ayuzunakuna, tantarikuiku. Wari kunamanta, kunamanta, tiras kamin coca yavuma, mana alinsus, ezringu kunamango wani wanka, ukakanku. Most of the time, to pass those antinatalist policies in the South, Northern country uh, say it's for the good of those people. From the first um, demographic policy, a theory was upheld. The reason why people are still poor in the South and why they're country is not developed is because people are too many and people are poor because they, they have because of the population growth. 
This theory was popularized by an economist, a British economist called Mathus in the 18th century. In the 50s, when we tried to enforce new population policy uh, on southern countries, we called that neo-Mathusianism. The African continent is fascinating because it is the last one to have entered a transitional phase and it's still the one with the greatest population growth rate. Programs to limit uh, population growth were paid by an international fund, mainly American, but indirectly because it was through cooperation or NGOs and private foundations. In 1994, the Cairo conference was held and it was a turning point. In the last video, I talked about Loretta Ross and her work with women of Africa, African descent for reproductive justice. And because of their work, the tenets of reproductive justice um, rights as a social right emerged and it was at the Cairo conference. So it is the equality of men and women to do what the hell they want to do with their bodies and to be able to make babies or not make babies. On that behalf, measures to limit birth were enacted in Africa. In 1966, 25% of the African countries had a population policy to limit birth. In 2007, 72% of them had a demographic policy. Always for this policy, the same theory. Economic growth and end of poverty will come if we regulate population growth. Knowing that Africa and Asia have still not the highest population rate, um, birth rates, while in Europe it's been falling for centuries. So I found multiple studies that said there is absolutely no proof at all economically that we can link population growth to poverty. A study argues that in the name of the same development objective, colonial states have generally conducted natalist populations in protectorates and political colonies. From a force, it becomes a problem. When the former colonies became independent, they were suddenly told to um, reduce their fertility rates. But before that, they were said to make as many babies as possible. All empires need bodies. Mm -hmm. mm. And they need bodies for their economies. They need bodies for their armies. They need bodies for their labor force. They need bodies. I also read a study about demographics in Latin America and Economics have disproved the theory that, economic, that population growth allows economic growth. Uh, for example, in the 60s, high economic growth worked very well with high population growth in Brazil, Mexico, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, etc. So demographic policies, whether it is in the north or in the south, have a great communication. In the north, for single mom allowance, they say it's for women's rights. In the south, um, for forced sterilization or anything else. They say it's for women's rights, but also to end poverty in those countries. But the real intention behind all those reproductive policies is a will to control the fertility rate and the will to control the economy to be the strongest, to stay the strongest. So it always goes back to nationalism. We're never talking about the attack on abortion in isolation without the try without the attempt of white men to perpetually control an anti-democratic process, an authoritarian state that compels white women to have more babies while they kill off the, as many black and brown ones as they can. Nira Yuval Davis, in her study about pronatism in Israel states, wrote, demographic policies often seem to be determined by worries over sufficient labor power for the national economy. A closer examination of national demographic policies as well as welfare state policies, however, will reveal that national political rather than economic interests lie behind the desire to have more children, or rather, more children of a specific origin. At that point of my research, I was really far from the reason I had started to work on reproductive justice in the first place, and I was stuck. 
there was something fundamental that I couldn't understand. I had realized how fundamentally our reproductive behaviors were directed toward a certain path by governments, whether it was to make more or fewer babies, whether it was by using soft or hard means. I had understood that pronatalism was linked to scientific racism. I also had understood I was an unwanted child. I understood that demographic policies were motivated by risks of being below the replacement level in the north and the possibility of better lives in the south, although none of those were proven to be exact, and that the real motivation beneath all of that was power, because power is number, and number is power. I also had understood that demographic policies were the royal route for privileged people, mostly men, to make laws about women's bodies and rights. J'arrive pas à trouver ce qui dans la société, alors qu'on passe des lois sur l'avortement, qu'on passe des lois sur la, la pilule, etc., et que légalement on a l'air d'avancer, j'arrive pas à trouver ce qui dans la société euh, euh, fait que moi, en tant que femme, j'ai grandi avec cette idée qui n'a jamais été questionnée à aucun moment, cette idée que j'allais faire un enfant à un moment donné. Je suis complètement perdue euh, dans mes recherches. À la fois j'ai beaucoup de choses, à la fois euh, j'ai même pas répondu à ma question. Help! Moi, je n'ai jamais senti de pression au moment où je répondais euh, « non, je ne veux pas d'enfant ». quoi. Ou quand c'était une femme qui disait qu'elle ne voulait pas avoir d'enfant, ça devenait le sujet de conversation. Quand c'est euh, bah, orienté vers ma copine ou un truc comme ça, là non, on attend une réponse argumentée, d'expliquer pourquoi. « Ah oui, c'est bizarre, euh, quelles sont les raisons qui t'amènent à ça ?» Donc comme si c'était du coup euh, accidentel et pas juste du choix. Malgré le fait qu'on ait des débats vraiment sur les égalités qui soient beaucoup plus ouverts, je pense, aujourd'hui. Il enfin, y a quand même un truc... Pourquoi, moi, on ne pose pas la, la question de la même façon que quand on le pose à, à ma copine ou à une amie